Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Mortals, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. blessings and of his call upon our lives, that we indeed may be part of this great celebration of World Communion Day. Welcome to worship. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this day, for the opportunity to gather once again in Jesus' name here in this place, surrounded by the memories, by the rememberings of our hearts for days gone by, all of the times when, when we were hungry, Lord, and you fed us when we were in need and you provided everything and more. We thank you, Lord, as we gather this day. Hear our praise and and upon our lips and upon our hearts. For Christ's glory we pray. Amen. You're my joy, my right. 
I remembered this time. Sometimes I forget to turn my microphone on. Good morning once again, and, and welcome to worship. It's a joy to see your shining faces, even behind a mask. I can see your eyes shining, and that's a good sign. You are most welcome here in this wonderful, generous, and open family of God here at Cicero United Methodist. We want to welcome and thank you. Remember that uh, as you continue throughout the week uh, to call in, some of you are, we, we are starting, I guess it's what it's called, it's a, a permanent coming list. But still call, let us know. Uh, it helps us keep track of the attendance, and uh, it's good for keeping in communication in case something were to happen. We'd know that uh, you were intending to come, and, and you know we'll wait a little longer. I, I can wait. But uh, in the meantime, it helps us keep track of how you're doing, and we thank you for your patience with that. Uh, know that we, we do some... Uh, Sanitizing. We have hand sanitizer both at the welcome desk and we're going to have it a little bit later here during our time as we come to the table of the Lord. Uh, please remain masked during worship. We do that so that we can continue to serve others. It's not so much about us, but we're trying to provide for others so that no one feel at risk at all coming as we gather to praise God. The worship team, as some of you may notice, we leave just for a moment to go into the... the uh, the fellowship hall for a time of prayer, and then we come back in with our masks on, and when we get up to the platform here, we take them off so that we can provide the best diction and clarity for the singing, and we've provided an extra three rows so that you're sitting even farther back than what's recommended, and we'll stay up here, and you all stay there, and hopefully you'll hear our best and know that it's not intended to, to cause anyone concern, but to lift our highest praise and best effort uh, in honor of the Lord. The, um, the words and scripture for things will be placed on the screens. You've seen that already. Uh, we continue to do that so that while I cannot encourage you to sing, you all can hum. And if you want to speak the words, that's fine. I understand. Um, and if a word happens to come out sounding like singing, I'm not going to come back there as the word police. But in order to keep everyone as healthy and, and, uh, as possible, we're, we're doing it this way in order to conform to the standards and recommendations of our conference in the state. Our offering time is different for those who may not have been here for a while. Instead of uh, sharing a common plate, please note that if you came in the center aisle, there was already a small stand back there with an offering basket. You're encouraged to leave your offering either on the way in or on the way out. And know that it still applies to the various ministries you intended to go to. It's just that in, in avoiding sharing a common plate, we have avoided sharing any possible uh, uh, germs in that. Let's see, what else I wanted to share? Uh, there's some meetings that are going to be coming up uh, this week. Uh, there's going to be a, a nominations meeting. So if you're on the nominations team, expect to get a phone call from me sometime tomorrow. Uh, finance meets Thursday evening at 7 p.m. And as we are now within uh, six weeks or so, seven weeks, of our charge conference, uh, each team will be getting a, an opportunity to meet so that we can have whatever information is important to have for that gathering. Our charge conference is on November 22nd at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It will be a virtual ch charge conference, so we're not actually going to be gathering, but we'll be gathering in that virtual space in the interweb, as I like to think of it. Uh, at the completion of our worship, we'll invite you to exit through the same door you came. Uh, now that we're all inside, what used to be the entrance has now been designated exit. So we don't have any problem conforming to those regulations. 
And a little bit further on when we get to the table, we'll give you, well, maybe I'll give you some instruction briefly now. We're going to invite people to come forward up the center aisle, maintaining that six-foot distance. And you can stagger one from this side, one from that side. We encourage you to take a, a short uh, sanitizing moment at the table and then either go to the left and be served uh, bread and a cup or to the, well, actually, it'll be your right, my left, or your left, my right. Go to, to the bread and the cup. And then as you receive the cup, only as you receive the bread and cup, then as you're moving to the next station, remove your mask, uh, take the, the, uh, the item, and then in the second pew, you'll notice there's already a trash basket. You can put the cup on your way back to your seat. And that way we can, I think, move steadily and completely through that uh, a table in a way that provides the best opportunity for every, everyone to celebrate something that we have long missed for these uh, at least six months or so. I think those are all the announcements. I'm sure to miss something, but if it comes to me, I'll share it later. Sorry. Oh, yes, there's a new study group. You all, if, did anybody get their newsletters? Yeah, okay. There's a new study group starting. Uh, there's at least one study group on, on Zoom. If some people uh, feel safe enough, we might be able to have a very small group and still be able to meet in person here in the worship, uh, in the welcome room. Or we could start another Zoom group at a, at a different time. But that's currently going to meet a week from this coming Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, and if you'll call in or email in the church, we'll make sure you're on that list. It's uh, very inexpensive. It's only $3. It's a book by um, Ken Davis called Being Fully Alive, particularly in a world that is so serious right now. I think that's going to really touch our hearts. So you're invited to be, participate in that. More information will be coming. There's an article in the newsletter about it. I think that's it, right? I think that's it. I, I pray that I have missed. Yes, I have one other thing. Look at the screen. Oh, look at the screen, everybody. Isn't that pretty? We are doing trunk or treat. And uh, there's information also in the newsletter about that. It's going to be uh, Saturday, and it's a change this year. It's going to be 3 to 5. Uh, we've done that in order to try to cooperate with, with uh, young families and their children and the opportunity they may or may not choose to engage in Actual trick-or-treating after that, it's up to them. But for our time, it'll be daylight, and it'll be just as scary as ever. But uh, um, all the rest of the information is there. Oh, yes. Now, did you all bring your rolls to church? Well, not, not those rolls, but these rolls. Okay? Outreach Ministry is looking for single-wrapped toilet rolls. And I know everybody's immediately thinking, but they're more expensive. We know that. The issue is... In this season of COVID, uh, no one wants to take an unwrapped roll of toilet paper, even though it's something you need. And so as, as disciples of Jesus, we're willing to meet the people where they are. And so what they've asked for is if we could provide some packaged single rolls. So as you think of it during your week, if you're out shopping or if you haven't done your shopping for October yet, uh, bring in some. We're going to start a little stack over here. And we'll see how big of a mountain we can provide for our community outreach ministries team and for those people who realize how important this is in our everyday life. And we thank you for understanding that uh, it may be a few pennies more, but it, it doesn't do any good if we offer someone something that they're not going to use and ends up being thrown away. So, yeah, bring your rolls. And if you've got one of those other ones, let me know. I'll go for a ride with you. <laughs> that would be awesome. Thank you. Isn't that pretty? I like that. Bring your rolls to church. We come to a time of giving, and as I said each week, it is slightly different. It's different in that we don't actually get to pass that common plate amongst uh, the members and the fellowship here, but it's, it's still a time when we can sit and for a few moments consider the blessings we have received at the hand of God. Now, admittedly, some of those blessings are more challenging to receive than others, but we are nevertheless blessed. We who were once lost, we who were once without hope, have been blessed, found, and regained hope in eternal life through Jesus Christ. And our days, our nights, our mere existence is blessing upon blessing. For we cannot control our life. God grants it to us. We don't get to say this and that. We have to deal with what happens. So as we take these few moments, and as Ben plays a, a, a musical offering, may we consider how we are serving God in, in our material items. Are we giving commensurate with our thanksgiving or are we holding back 
waiting for something else to fall, waiting, waiting to see if God will provide, or are we trusting to, to know God will provide and to give out of generosity? It's a time when we can consider where we are and have God speak to us. May this be a time of blessing as we call upon the Lord in our giving. Morning, boys and girls. Have you ever run in a race? How about a long race? Well, there are some people who regularly run in long races. It's called a marathon. It's 26 miles and 385 yards long. That's a long, long way. One person is celebrated as the first place across the finish line like this person in the photo. See? But because these races are so demanding, each and every person who crosses the line is considered a winner for just having completed this really difficult race. The Apostle Paul in our Bible study today explains that as a follower of Jesus, we are like those who may not have finished in first place, but are encouraged to press on in our own race with the fact that just finishing the race like Paul will be our greatest prize. And that prize is everlasting life in Jesus Christ. And that is good news. Let's pray. Father God, help us to run our race and claim the prize of everlasting life in Jesus, with Jesus in heaven. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Jesus loves you. Bye.
the body that was torn for us. This is the blood that was spilled, points to the pain you endured for us, points to the shame, the blame, the guilt. Trust in the flesh, I more, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, 
if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ben. Those of uh, who've read uh, Greek history may already know where I'm going to start today. Uh, maybe you don't. Sometimes I'm not sure where I'm going to start. I'm going to start with a prayer. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our heart, and the outward actions of our lives, and everything we do, everything we say, in who we are living into. Be holy and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's children said, Amen. So the gentleman's name is Pheipides. No, it's not Marvin. It's not Harold. It's not even Brutus. It's Pheipides. And for those of you who may know of, of such a person, he was what was termed a a meridome, a day courier for the Greek army. His task was to be a runner. You see, long before cell phones, long before regular phones, long before um, any long-distance courier, no Pony Express. This is like um, Dr. Peabody's way, way, way back machine from those who used to watch cartoons. Um, the way they transmitted information from one place to another was to give it to someone, and then that someone was assigned to go and to run to that other place. So this gentleman we're talking about, Pheopides, is um, generally known for the, uh, the big run between Marathon and Athens, which just happens to be a little over 26 miles. And therefore, we, those long runs that you hear people doing, or maybe some of you have done, are called marathon runs. Okay, what had happened is the Persian army had met the Athens at army at, at the place called Marathon, and though they were outnumbered many to one, the Persians were a big invading force. Nevertheless, a good plan, good plan, was allowed the the Athenian army to to, to fight well, and uh, just shortly before they engaged, the Athenian gentle, uh, general in charge sent. Um, Pheopides, I've got to keep looking at his name. Pheopides and told him, look, if you can run from here to Sparta, ask the Spartans if they'll come and help us fight because they're known for their, uh, their ruggedness and, and their fierceness in battle. And so he was launched on a multiple-day trip from where he was to Sparta. Now, some of the, the literature I've read, that was upwards of 150 miles. I can't even imagine giving, being given an assignment to say, look, we're, you're leaving here today, run as fast and as long as you can and get there and, and let them know we're in dire need, we need their help. So anyway, Pheopides took off and went. And it does not say how long it took, but he arrived there and Sparta says, yes, we'd like to come, but we're in the middle of a religious celebration and so as soon as we're done, we'll come. So you run back and tell them we're on our way. So for all of you who are really good at math, they don't say how long he rested but I suspect it wasn't long. So he's back at, at, at the marathon, at the battle station. And of course, because it took so long, by the time he arrives at marathon, the battle has pretty much already been claimed. Even though they were grossly outnumbered, by their better plan and, and good general uh, leading, uh, the Athenians were able to be victorious. And so our good buddy, Pheopides, who has just been hanging around the camp, was given the the task to run back to Athens, which is another 26 miles, to tell them, rejoice, we conquered. And so he does. And he runs back from Marathon to Athens, 26 miles 
and a plus a little bit. I guess it's been determined 385 yards or something. And he rushes into the assembly. He, he stands before them and announces the news. It's good news. We've won. And he collapses and dies. And, of course, I think it was Browning that went on to write some, some uh, eloquent poetry about, you know, he, he arrived sharing this wonderful news. It was the high point of his life. He had given himself to the task that he was given, and he did it with such intensity, such wholeheartedness, that when the task was over, his heart was empty and he just keeled over. Well, you see, in some ways, Paul knows about this. And what we're talking about is Paul's running a race. Little Marvin was running a race, not as long as a marathon perhaps, but it is a race. And so I wanted to talk with us this day about, about some things that, uh, that parallel this story. Because it's not just a story in, in Greek history. It helps us understand how we move through our life as runners for Christ. In the Greek word, the, the Greek, the word new for good, let me start again. In the Greek, the word for good news um, talks about sharing glad tidings of salvation. Proclaiming the grace of God is now manifest, is now present and pledged in Christ. That's great news for those who had long been oppressed, those who had long been imprisoned, those who had long been sick and broken. Suddenly the good news is upon us. Rejoice! Paul writes his story. And as Ben so eloquently read from the King James Version, he begins with this long list. There's at least seven items of which Paul can count saying, I am one of the elite Jews. I've done everything that's been asked for me from the moment of my birth. I have lived completely under the law and am blameless under it. If any man had, had reason to, to boast, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day, just as, Jew, just as Jesus was. His parents were a family of faith. They made sure that he stepped right in line with all of the practices of the day. He wasn't able to go himself, of course, being only eight days old. But his parents carried him, made sure that he was brought into the faith at a very early age. From, from the very beginnings, Paul, then Saul, was brought up in the faith. Secondly, of the stock of Israel, a long genealogy of faith. He could, he could tell you his, his father and his father's father and his father's father. We have been the people of Israel for generation upon generation. Of the tribe of Benjamin, you know, that was Jacob's favorite son. The first king of Israel was a Benjamite, highly looked up to within all the tribes of Israel. The tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrew in Paul's own writing. I was part of that elite mixture, a leader in faith, one who knew the scriptures, who knew how to apply them. And yes, as to the law, he was a Pharisee. It was one of the best religious political groups in Israel. They believed in scripture. They believed in angels. They believed in resurrection. They believed in miracles. And they had a certain nationalistic pride about them. As for zeal, well, we all know Saul was out persecuting Christians. He was so determined he was going to cleanse Israel from all these wayward uh, fanatics who were following Jesus. He certainly was filled with zeal to accomplish what God had put before him. And as to touching righteousness in the law, he writes that he was blameless. He did everything that was asked right to the letter, and he knew the letter. Remarkable. If you were writing a, 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 your resume, you could have no better resume than that in terms of the people Israel in that time in history. And yet, he, in verse 7, what does he say? And yet, whatever gains I had... And all this has been his entire life. Whatever gains I had, I've come to regard as loss because of Christ. The Greek is a little more dramatic. It, it, it regards as rubbish, as almost as dung, okay? It doesn't matter anymore. All of this to which I applied my life and the great learning and the great effort that I, I, I made to keep myself clearly within the boundary of the law, and yet I regard it as rubbish because of Christ. And more than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Of being able to run the race in Jesus. You see, in some ways, do you remember going, now this is going to take some of us way back. Remember going to the schoolyard where they used to have outdoor 
games and, and, and devices. I'm going to remember a teeter-totter. Remember that? And do you remember the teeter-totter had at least three settings? It was one that was balanced and it was one that was adjusted for either side so that if you had a child or a friend who was a little um, more ever dupoy than the other one, that you could offset for that. And I want you to think of setting that teeter-totter all the way to one side, okay? And, and on that side, the big long lever arm, we put all of Paul's accomplishments, his, his circumcision, his, his genealogy in, in being a, a, a person of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, his zealous nature to protect the faith, uh, touching righteousness. All of this gets piled on, on this long lever arm of a teeter-totter. And you know what's on the other side? Paul says, on this other side, it's only a little short lever arm. For us, it would be impossible to lift that. Because the fulcrum is far too close. We only have a little seat to sit on now. All the weight, all of the, all the things he's accomplished is, bare, is on that side. Paul says, it doesn't matter. I sit on this side. The preciousness, the uniqueness, the oneness of being known, being found in Christ. Because all the rest of that doesn't matter. It balances out. In fact, it exceeds it. He writes his story in full disclosure in all the ways he should be revered. He certainly was feared by those who were the fledgling Christians at the time. But he's running a race that's heading in the wrong direction. And after his Damascus Road experience, long before he's writing this from the Philippians, uh, the letter to the Philippians while he's still imprisoned in jail, he has made a, a drastic change in his life. For Jesus has changed his direction and his manner. A different direction. He's repented. He's now moving in a direction that God leads rather than the direction the law leads. He's separated from the law. He's now under grace. And he's living in a different manner. Um, some of us may remember uh, back in 1964, there was an NFL game between the 49ers and the Vikings. And there was a defensive player by the name of Jim Marshall and at one point in the scrimmage, uh, there was a fumble. And Jim looked down and he saw a loose football. And, and briefly he looked up and he saw his way clear to the end zone. And so he scooped up that football and he started running. Now he's a defensive lineman. They're not pretty to watch. Run. And, he's limited, and he can hear the crowds going. Rah! You know, and he's going, he says, I'm going to make it. And he hears his teammates come running alongside him, shouting and shouting. And you know what? He can't hear it. He's so determined. I'm going to make that end zone. And sure enough, he finally lumbers in the end zone, and he scores the touchdown, and he throws the football up into the stands. And one of the 49ers comes over and gives him a big hug because he just scored a touchdown for the 49ers. It was the wrong end zone. He was absolutely sure what he was doing was right. And he put everything he had into going forward. There's, a, there's another story of a man on his way home, late at night, maybe not quite dark, end of summertime, but it's, it's later in the afternoon, and uh, his wife is concerned about it. He hasn't gotten home yet. Wife is concerned he's out on the highway. She phones him on his cell phone, and foolishly, he picks up the telephone and answers the phone. And she says, now, be careful, dear, because I've just heard on the radio that there's there's someone on the expressway going in the wrong direction. So please be careful on your way home. We want you to get home safely. And his, his husband returns and says, yeah, you won't believe it. Says, it's not just one. There's hundreds of them out here. <laughs> it's easy for us to convince ourselves we're going in the right direction. When in fact, we may be going in entirely the opposite direction from where God would have us. Such was the case with Paul with Saul before he became Paul. He was determined. He knew there was a path of life. He knew there was a path that led to life. He just was not on it. Now, it's interesting because some of us in our modern-day situations think that the, the road that we have to travel, the road we're running, the race we're running, is a little more challenging than perhaps in earlier times. But I want to, I want to share with us one other thing about our current times uh, in, in the book Born to Run, there's an author, Christopher McDougall. He talks that most of us are running the wrong way. Those of us that run, that would not be me. 
unless there's a very large animal behind me. And then I'm not sure whether it's a good thing to run it. But anyway, he argues that most of us have been running the wrong way, literally. We, we view running as a means to an end. Like getting in shape or living longer. And those are okay. And when we run, we try to protect ourselves against injury. We get these special padded custom-made shoes, custom-made running shorts, you know. We have custom everything because we want to have it just perfect. And he... he takes a, a note from history. There's a tribe in Mexico called the Terra Humara who shows us a different way of running. They have honed the ability to run hundreds of miles at a clip without rest or without injury. They wear simple sandals, just leather-made sandals with a single thong that wraps up and wraps around, 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 and no tie, just tucks underneath it. So from a young age, from the very earliest days, they're running, running, running everywhere. But they're running on the pads of their feet, not on the balls or the arches. And they run, run, run. Now he says that this tribe run the way they do because they understand that running is their way of life. It's a part of what it means to be human for them. At the heart of how the human body evolved, perhaps in the first place. Why else would so many crowd of human beings get the crazy idea to run together for 26 miles? You ever see the start of these marathons? It's not just four or five people decide. There's hundreds of people. they got their little number on the front unless they were made for it, unless it was somehow already printed in their DNA. The Terra Humara understand intrinsically that the human body is born to run. They don't view running as a chore, as a means to an end, or as only a battle of willpower, but it's a gift worthy of itself. Now there's a scene in the book where a well-known track coach is watching these two tribal runners complete, compete in a marathon. It's 100 miles through the mountains. I mean, I, as I'm reading this, I, I, it just boggled my mind. The track coach is studying the runners, watching their technique, trying to figure out what makes them tick, what lessons he can learn to take back to his team. But what strikes the coach most is that these runners, it's not their technique. It's the joy with which they run. It's the joy with which they run. They, they race up the course's most heartbreaking hills, and they're still laughing, turning up the slopes like kids playing in a leaf pile. For them, this is the joy of life. We're running. And though it goes up or down or sideways, we get to run. What a blessing. What makes them special is that they haven't forgotten what it means to love the act of running itself. Now, students of this Philippian text marvel at how often Paul's letter sounds notes of joy, even though he's in prison while he's writing this. Paul is running a race. He's pressing on. In the later verses, he's straining forward for what lies ahead. And he's doing it while he's laughing. He's running in a different way now than he ran before. Before he was constrained by the law. You must run this way. You must run this way. Now he's running because I'm free. I was once oppressed. I was once confined. I was once bound. But now I'm free. Oh, let's run. He's running with the freedom of someone who no longer has anything to prove. Ah. There's not another battle he must conquer by gritting his teeth and trying harder because now the marathon-like news has reached him that God has already conquered, that God has already won battle. Christ has done for him what he could not do for himself. He no longer has to justify his existence by his achievements in the race through life. That's important for us to hear. Christ's sacrifice for him has justified his existence. He has nothing to prove, only love to show. And so that, if I may use Greek myth again, this atlas-like burden of expectation on his shoulders has been removed. Life is no longer about what he's able to accomplish and what he's able to achieve. Now the race of him, however hard it might be, is not a grind of guilt, but a race of grace. He's free to choose to run. He runs now not because others have told him to, but because he wants to. He follows Jesus not because he must, but because he may. He's been invited. Because he can. He runs towards Christ not because he has to, but because he has to. He knows that this race is not something foreign to him. He was born to run. I know, I was thinking about do 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 But he hits the hill with a smile because forgiveness has set him free to lose or fail or to disappoint expectations. Because 
And hear this. Because when all is forgiven, all can be risked. When all is forgiven, all can be risked. He, he runs the race sweating drops of joy because he loves the act of running himself. Runs because there is nothing better than knowing the beauty and love of Christ and letting it flow through you to others. He runs because all of the way to heaven is heaven. Because the Christ who is the prize at the end of the race is also mysteriously the pace setter who is the partner at our side meeting us stride by stride as we race through life. This race is not a grim test of our willpower or personal worth anymore. It's a joyous jaunt, if you will, across the plain of Marathon with good news filling up our soul. Rejoice. We have conquered. Rejoice. Jesus is here. So, brothers and sisters, where does your confidence really lie? What are you chasing after? What's getting you up in the morning and putting you in motion? Are you running the right way? Are you running in the right direction? Do you want to know Christ and to be like him? If so, there is good news. Rejoice. We have conquered. Maybe it should be rejoice. The Lord has conquered. For love has won. And so run for your life. Run for your life. Run this race because you were born to run this race. Find some running partners. Forget what lies behind. Strain forward to what lies just ahead. Press on toward the goal. Keep your eyes on the prize. Oh, how does he, how does he end this? He says, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, I want to know Christ. I want to know the fullness of Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him. Not just to be known by him, but to know him. To be embraced by the presence of the Almighty in Christ. Because the race and the prize is Jesus. And he is so worth it. Rejoice, we have conquered. Amen. As we come to a time of prayer this day, we are mindful that uh, it is a time where this day in particular throughout all the world, uh, we try to celebrate World Communion, a time when all Christians, all who call Christ as Lord and Savior, are able to come to his table and to be able to share and to give thanks for what they've received during their race. It is a time such as today when as we hear this song being sung, we desire to be more like you, Lord, that we might be transformed from who we were into who we were created to be, more like you. Hear this word.
I always think it's a good thing to start with some praise when we come to prayers of the people. And uh, we have one, at least one, who's celebrating here today. And uh, you already know the words of the song I'm going to sing. The only word you don't know is the name. So when we get to that name, we'll all say it together, okay? So it goes, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear June. Happy birthday to you. Yay, happy birthday. I hope you have a wonderful birthday, June. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. What spirit. Oh, how great it is to be able to gather together here this day and to celebrate a birthday. You notice, Lord, we didn't ask which birthday it was. It was a birthday, and we're thankful for life, and we're thankful for this birthday, and we pray she's able to enjoy many more in your grace. But, Lord, we're also thankful for all the blessings we've received since last we gathered together here in this place. And so for all those silent prayers, for all those concerns and cares that we moved from our homes into this holy space, we lift them to you now in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. We're thankful, Lord, that even though our hearts may not have formed those words upon our lips yet, nevertheless, your spirit understands and hears our heart's desire. Thank you for being a compassionate, loving God who always is attentive to the needs of his children. Lord, for those times since last we met when we have missed the mark, when we intended to do things, when we had aspirations to be better than we were before and failed, we now acknowledge that before you and we ask for your forgiveness and blessing that we might leave that burden of carrying our imperfectness here at the foot of the cross and to move away to run the rest of our race free and joyful for who you are and who you called us to be. Help us to hold that lesson from Brother Paul that each of us has a race to run and we should run it with joy upon our face for you are right by our side. And we thank you for that, that never-ending promise that whether uphill, downhill, whether it's a dangerous slope or whether it's a wide open space, whether we trip and fall, whether we stumble, or whether we just stride after stride with a smile on our face, giving praise to your, your holy name, we know you're right alongside us. Nothing in all of creation can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And today we pray for those who are feeling that brokenness, body, mind, and spirit, however it is that they feel separated and hurt and ill, we pray in the name of Jesus that you come and meet them at the greatest point of need and in your compassion, in your proven love, surround them with your presence that they might feel that holiness and warmth, value and worth, not from what they've achieved or accomplished, but from who you created them to be. And Lord, we pray also in this day, a day we celebrate as a world church coming to your table, a table where none of us None of us could have a seat apart from your grace. But by your word, you've promised that each of us do have a place. That there's room for all. There's grace sufficient for all our needs. We will come and be fed. We thank you. 
We remember that Jesus prayed that we might be one. One in spirit, one in mission, one in union and communion with each other and with you, oh God. So today, we confess our fumblings and failures in accomplishing this unity as we set aside yet another day to remind ourselves of the task yet ahead. The race is not yet complete, Lord. We have more to run. On this World Communion Sunday, give us eyes to recognize your reflection in the eyes of Christians everywhere. Our brothers and sisters are just beyond these walls. We see them. We greet them every day. Give us a mind to accept and celebrate our differences. So many of us know what it's like to have been on the wrong journey, heading in the wrong direction. Give us a big heart, big enough to love your children everywhere. They don't have to come from this community. They don't have to be in the same zip code. They don't have to speak the same language. They are your children, Lord. And by your example, help us love all of them without condition. We want to thank you for setting a table with space enough for all of us, every single one. And we thank you in the name that is the name above all names, a name at which one day every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. It is a name precious upon our lips, a name which spoken softly brings us comfort, which when we cry out brings us peace, for we know he understands our condition. He understands our fear. He understands what it is to be in this earthly frame, longing for our home, longing to be in your holy presence. In his high and holy name, O oh God, we together join in unity in a prayer you taught us, a prayer that was lifted so simply one day long ago on a hillside and has been spoken millions and millions of times and will yet again until your glorious kingdom comes to fruition. But it helps join us in unity, remembering who it is you've created us to be. So here, Lord, as we pray together, hear your children as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so I want to do this, this, this. I'm coming. Oh, well, that's really loud. That worked really loud, didn't it? Maybe I got to do it this way. That might be a little bit better. Is that better? Sorry, I'm coming a little closer. So I'm going to explain how we want to do this. We're going to have a few moments of blessing and consecration. But our intention is that to offer the Lord's table for all who would receive it. And we would invite you to come, when it's time, to come singly from alternate sides up to center aisle. So there'll be one walking on this side and about six feet back on that side. There'll be someone and then another person, another person, where you would come and do just as I did, put a little push, and then either to the right or to the left, Unless you need gluten-free bread, there would be a bread station where you will hold your hand and they will, wearing gloves, will drop a piece of bread into your hand. At that time, I would ask you to move away, open your mask, and then take the bread, and then go to the next station where they will hand you from the top a small cup and you will receive it. And again, move away, move your mask, take it, and then on either side there is already a garbage can, so you can then move back to your seat. It's intended to, to have a certain flow to it. I know it'll, it may be a little challenging at times, but it's our hope that in doing so, we will serve you, the Lord's table, and then we'll serve the musicians, and then we'll be able to, to close our worship together. As we come together, we are mindful that each time we come in the name of Jesus, we are blessed by his presence and the meal he left to his disciples, for it was so long ago on that night in Jerusalem, after the Passover meal, that Jesus came and he took bread. After meeting with his disciples, he took a fresh loaf. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me.
And after the supper was over, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my blood which is given for you, shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. And in two simple acts, bread in the cup, he offered to every single disciple at that table, the one who would betray, the one who would deny, the one who would inevitably find some way to stumble and fall. But grace was offered to each. It was not on their merit. It was on their identity in him. And just as that was then, so it is today. That we had God's blessing. We ask God's blessing upon this simple meal of bread and cup. That it might be not just a representation of your love for us, O God, but by the power of your Holy Spirit working in us, be a catalyst for our change. That when we move from this meal, we are no longer hungry. We are being fed by your Spirit and your presence in us. Oh God, we ask you to come and to bless this gathering, to bless the sharing of this meal, that it might meet and exceed our need. And we ask all this in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. I will ask our servants to come forward where we will get appropriately... Here we go. The one other thing which I should mention, and that is, as you're coming forward, the live stream will move to, screen, will, will move to uh, rotating screens so that during our actual communion, no live streaming will be showing any people coming forward. That's to provide the best opportunity for us to have a private moment of worship. And uh, I wanted to be aware of that so that in coming forward, no one but those of us who are in this church building know you're here. And I, I pray that that will be a comfort to you as we uh, move into this time together. We have a special station for gluten-free. And if that is a need you have... The individual pieces are separated out very far away. So, I got one. We're taking this. You got that. So I invite you, as the Spirit would lead, to come and realize we're trying to take one at a time, but we'll, that way we can run two, two aisles. Come and receive at the table of the Lord.
Let us be in prayer. Oh, holy God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us once again. Grant that as we go forth from this place, we go forth empowered by your present spirit, encouraged for the road ahead, toughened for whatever obstacles we may find, knowing that with you at our side, we have already succeeded. The triumph is yours. The glory belongs to you. And the grace is is sufficient for all our needs. 
In Christ we give you thanks. Amen. Song. A song of celebration. Okay. And we can know that he who started the work will be faithful to complete it, for he is perfect. His love has found us. His love has set us free. His love has now set us on the right path in the direction he shows. With resources he provides, let us rejoice. We have conquered. May you go in peace this week and run your race filled with joy, filled with extravagant love for all. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go now with God.